Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's OXIS Corporate Performance Series webinar, A Cloud Primer, the Cloud for Non-Technical People. My name is Yaslan Arroyo and I'm the moderator for today's webinar. At this point, I'd like to introduce our feature speaker with OXIS, Avro Prieto. Avro is the CIO and Senior VP of Managed Services for OXIS, where he leads our IT outsourcing and solutions practice. Alvaro diligently keeps up to date with emerging technologies and is focused on selecting and implementing the most cost-effective services and IT solutions to help clients grow their business. Before we begin, let me remind all participants that we welcome your questions. Please submit them in your webinar panel at any time. We'll address your questions at the conclusion of the webinar. And with that, I'll turn it over to our speaker, Alvaro Prieto. Alvaro? Uh, thank you, Yasmin, and many thanks to all of you for attending this uh, webinar today. I know it's lunchtime at, uh, in the eastern United States, so I really appreciate you taking the time out, uh, are you, uh, out of your lunch uh, to join me here. Um, the purpose of the webinar is really here to provide you with an introduction to cloud technologies. Um, as you know, probably uh, there's a lot of buzz on the cloud today. And I'm hoping that uh, through these, uh, through these uh, slides that I have that uh, you'll have a, a good understanding of the technology and that uh, hopefully that will spark some interest to look into, into this uh, exciting technology. Um, I don't know much about your backgrounds, but I'm assuming you're not that technical, so I will keep it uh, to very uh, you know, practical terms. But if there's any questions during the webinar that uh, you see some kind of uh, terminology or something that I may have said that uh, you don't understand, feel free to post the questions on the on the pain, on the on the meeting uh, go to we the go to webinar uh, pane that you have on your screen. Hopefully, you uh, I'll get those questions and I'll answer them at the end of the uh, the session. So with that said, let's uh, let's start um, and. Um, just uh, I like to keep track of uh, a lot of different things on the, on the internet in terms of the amount of activity that is going on. And uh, just in the last minute since we started this webinar, um, as you see, there's been uh, lots of activity going on, about 240 email, uh, million emails uh, sent already in just in the last minute. Um, 61,000 of hours of music uh, listening on Pandora, and that's just Pandora. Uh, there's so many different uh, streaming media and uh, streaming music uh, services today that they're really taking the internet uh, using a lot of the actual capacity of the internet uh, today worldwide. Uh, the other one that is uh, not here but is is massive is uh, Netflix. Uh, a lot of the comp a lot of people um, are really watching uh, movies and using this service to uh, to deliver video to their and to the connected devices uh, and to their actual uh, tele uh, televisions at their own homes. But uh, Netflix on its own, if it would not be, you know, uh, compress the amount of data that they send, they would be using almost 90% of the internet capacity in terms of bandwidth worldwide. So it is a tremendous amount of traffic that is going on. And my point here is that um, a lot of these uh, technologies uh, or a lot of these activity is really being um, provided by cloud technologies. What you don't see and what is behind the scenes uh, are these massive infrastructures uh, that are spread out around the world, uh, all fully connected, that are, that are uh, delivering this type of activity to, to the end users. So the cloud has is, is been around for some time. Uh, just in the last, you know, let's say five years is when it has been kind of taking more of a mainstream uh, type of, uh, um, um, uh, everyone is really more of, uh, aware of it. And uh, so we're going to go through some of the key things that may make up the cloud. Uh, so hopefully uh, you will have a good understanding about uh, this technology. Um, so a couple of things here that, you know, technologies that are really on top of mind, uh, and I am in, in as a CIO here and being in, with a lot of our customers talking about technology pretty much on a daily basis, um, I have seen the changes myself uh, where most of our customers, let's say in 2012, were asking for uh, specific things to virtualize their infrastructures and this is the, what that means is to help them reduce 
the footprint that they were using in their data centers uh, to run a lot more in less kind of uh, uh, equipment, you know. So instead of having, let's say, 10 different servers, um, now they're running everything in one single box, in one single server, but then um, uh, the same for the same capacity that they were using in the past. So it's using less space, uh, it's using less electricity, less uh, heating and cooling that is needed. So there's a lot of companies, if not you know, the majority of companies today have done virtualization and that is the, the technology that it was a strategic technology in 2012 and actually in 2011 was also on the, on the very top three technologies. Uh, but cloud in the last year or so has become, you know, the top, if not the top, it's the top strategic technology for most companies. This information came from Gartner, which is a leading research organization worldwide for IT, mostly in the IT, in the IT space. Um, so as you see, cloud, cloud computing is, it is something that uh, I see it uh, by talking to our customers that they all want to see uh, how they can now migrate their virtualized infrastructure that they did in the past, in the last few years or five years, let's say they've been doing virtualization and reducing costs. Now they want to move to a cloud, uh, which is more of outside of their data center or outside of a data center that they, they, they rent and they have their own servers that they own uh, to move it into some sort of uh, um, cloud-based um, you know, data center where they only pay for what they need and that's one of the promises of the cloud that we're going to be discussing in a few minutes. Um, so the cloud is here to stay uh, and I keep saying this uh, to many of our uh, customers and, and in different uh, events that the cloud is here to stay. Uh, there's no, this is not some technology that is just, uh, you know, um, kind of, uh, uh, you know, is, 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 is modern, everybody it likes to talk about it because it's cool. Uh, there is some massive amount of investments being done and there's a massive about of, uh, amount of migrations that are being uh, happen, they're happening as we speak uh, from companies going from their own data centers to cloud-based technologies uh, and, uh, and that. So a couple of things also that uh, there's another report that I that I really, really like uh, is from the McKinsey Global Institute that talks about uh, key disruptive technologies uh, that are going to really revolutionize, you know, our lives in many ways and the economies around the world. Um, and this is from the McKinsey Global Institute. You're more than welcome to go to to that uh, to the McKinsey Global Institute and download this report, which is fascinating in terms of the amount of information that is there. But what I wanted to put put here is uh, some of the key technologies that they see. There's, they identified about 12 different technologies and the cloud being one of them, right? And the way they define it is the use of, you know, computer hardware, software resources to deliver over a network or the internet and deliver as a service, uh, which is the key uh, aspect of the cloud that is delivered as a service and you only basically use, uh, pay for what you use, which is, you know, uh, in a way revolutionary in the IT world uh, because in the past companies will basically you know buy hardware and software and keep it on their data center uh, whether they use it or not they will still have to pay for those assets um, as a matter of fact over 65 percent of most servers in most data centers uh, are only being you know uh, are, are used you know less than 35 percent. So there's a massive amount of capacity that is not being used, yet those companies are paying for those assets uh, on a regular basis. So in the cloud, you only pay for what you need. If the best analogy to the cloud, uh, to me, is the electrical system. So if, you, if your electricity, you pay at home for kilowatts, uh, every time, you know, if you turn off the lights, obviously you're not paying for, for the service. It's exactly the same thing with the cloud. You can literally turn off your computers or what they call instances on the cloud and you don't pay for that uh, and then everything is pretty much done um, as, as that, as a per use, per, per, per use uh, service. So other technologies that, um, you know, are in the report include the mobile internet, right, uh, which is basically, you know, the, as everybody knows, uh, iPads and, and, and mobile devices 
are being pretty much uh, one of the key disruptive technologies that are really driving growth and adoption uh, in a very fast way. Uh, but the mobile internet, you know, to be able to use your mobile device, you're actually using the cloud. Uh, so, to, for example, just a, uh, a very specific one, I'm sure you have some sort of Apple device. If you have an iPhone and you click on Siri, uh, just to ask a question to Siri, if you're not connected to the Internet, uh, Siri will not work. So, uh, when you connect to Siri, Siri is actually on a data center. Uh, it's on a cloud data center uh, for, for Apple, specifically to Apple. When you ask the question, it goes and then finds out in that data center, um, you know, if that question has been answered in the past. And it's been answered in the past, it will immediately send you the response. That's why it's so quick. Um, so most of the questions that you have, most people have already asked for those questions, and that's what is being stored in the in the in the Siri data center. Um, but like I said, if you're not connected to the cloud or to the internet in this case, it will not, uh, it will not, you will not be able to use that service. So that is, that is just a very quick example, uh, but most of the mobile internet technology is really fueled by cloud-based technologies to be able to make those devices more usable. Uh, the Internet of Things is uh, basically this um, concept of connecting different sensors. Um, uh, we're not talking, actually, the, the actual prediction for sensor technology over the next 10 years is that we're going to have over a trillion sensors connected to the Internet. That's one trillion, uh, not one billion. So it's a huge number of devices that have some intelligence in it and can transmit information to a data center. So uh, that data center, guess what, is going most likely to be a cloud center, a cloud data center that can take that information and process that information uh, in, a, in, a, in a very fast way. So this, this Internet of Things is going to be something that we're going to be uh, inundated with sensors all over the place, in our homes, on the streets, on our cars, you know, pretty much everywhere we go there's going to be sensors connected uh, providing information in real time as you see it right now on most of the traffic uh, in most of the U.S. cities, the traffic uh, displays are showing uh, time to arrive to a specific point and, and to from point A to point B on real time and that's because their sensors are actually connected on the road. Uh, people obviously don't see those but that's how that technology is working today. Um, the automation of knowledge work is another technology that is basically, this is creating robots that basically are tr literally replacing people that are basically doing very structured kind of processing. So when you have a robot, these robots mostly are going to run as well on a cloud base. So uh, the cloud basically is going to be processing what a normal person would be doing using this robotic uh, kind of technology. Um, and then other things like the genomics, which is pretty much uh, a way to, the, you know, to sequence your DNA uh, so a computer will know pretty much on a real-time basis if there's something wrong with your body. Um, and that is something that potentially has a huge, actually, potential to disrupt all the healthcare industry worldwide because if you would be able to basically go to your home and, you know, put your finger in this little device and that little device will capture your DNA uh, which will be transmitted to a cloud-based uh, center where they process and compare that to your genome signature and the genome signature for somebody is over 2.2 billion pieces of information. That's kind of how they decoded the the genome project that took about 13 years and a few billion dollars to to work to do, uh, but when you go to your house and you can you know have this very you know small little device, um, that information will be processed on a cloud, um, and then you will get your instant response in terms of whether something is you know out of whack with your DNA, 
and then that can potentially will trigger an activity to send that to your doctor so he knows what is going on or to your healthcare provider. So either way, but uh, the point is that, you know, from a technology perspective to make this work, uh, it really would require a, you know, a cloud-based kind of capability to process the amount of information um, that is going to be receiving from these type of technologies or these these type of uh, uh, technologies that we have actually here on the screen, you know, so um, so you know it, it it is it is it is that's why I keep saying that uh, the cloud is here to stay. Uh, the the, the is in our in, in, when you're in technology having a data center uh, in your at your location. Uh, seems to be kind of a, an old ways to do computing uh, so it is it is uh, something that uh, and the major providers really are are getting ready for this type to adopt these type of technologies over the next five to ten years so um, so let's look at a couple of viewpoints from different points from 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 different executives in companies so an executive would say that a cloud is a buyer-centric view of technology, right, where you have applications that are available. Uh, you can buy them or you can rent them, um, and then you can access them pretty much anywhere. Uh, so that is a, a pretty simple description of what the cloud really is. Um, the CFO will look at them, obviously, more from a financial perspective, and then he would say or she would say that uh, this would be a, a model that uh, it's a pay-as-you-go model um, and, uh, and it's a way to consume technology and just pay for what you need, which is very advantageous from a, from a financial perspective and that is one of the big promises that the cloud is delivering today. Um, the great thing about it too from a financial perspective is that these costs continue to go down. Uh, because as you know technology obviously gets cheaper uh, as, as it develops uh, so the technology and this price per per, per server per, per device let's say are going down on a, on a pretty much on a quarterly basis in most of these organizations um, and the CIO is, is, is mostly taking a look at it if you will from a technology perspective um, it's a model where you know um, he can have all of his systems or her systems um, on a virtualized kind of model, right? Delivering this um, way through uh, the internet, you know. So, so these are kind of uh, three different viewpoints um, that you can look at a very practical way to describe what the cloud is from an executive kind of perspective. Um, the definition that I found that is, is kind of interesting is, is, is this, you know, it's a pool of highly scalable, you know, abstracted infrastructure. It's a little bit technical, I would say, but it's abstracted because you can pinpoint exactly to, you know, a physical device. Everything is virtualized and I have another webinar on virtualization, but uh, we're not going to go into that. Uh, but uh, let's assume that it's, some, some, it's, a, it's a massive array of computers that can scale very quickly, right? And um, and its hosting application is built by the consumption. So um, that is that is a, a an easy, quick definition. But one of the key things here is these were about the pool of highly scalable infrast, you know, uh, uh, devices, right? Uh, because you have you only use what you need, but you're always being delivered. You're getting the actual performance. Of, of the performance that you need. Uh, for example, some companies uh, that have peak seasons, you know, on a sales perspective, and they let's say they're selling a lot of those uh, their products through the internet. Uh, when they get to peak season, they need a lot of capacity to process the orders and to process the number of users that go into their websites to place these orders. If assuming they would be an e-commerce kind of site. So to be able to do that, you really require a lot of capacity uh, to be ready uh, to be, you know, delivered so you don't have somebody getting stuck on an, on an order. Uh, so for that, you actually need to build your data center to be able to, you know, accommodate that kind of, those kind of things, those kind of loads. Uh, but then when the heavy season is over, you actually have we're left with those assets in most cases and, and use assets in most cases uh, for a while. 
and that is a tremendous loss uh, for most companies of having that type of you know non be not not capacity that's being used. So on the cloud, it will scale as you go. So if you need you know let's say if you have a an analogy to use servers and you need you know ten servers during the regular season and you need fifty servers during the peak season, well um, you will get you know the difference let's say is 40 servers you will get 40 servers um, provision you know ready to go in a matter of you know minutes in some cases as it is right now with some of the cloud providers that are able to deliver massive capacity extremely quickly so you can this provisioning of those of those of that capacity can be done um, in a very fast way and you only would use it only for the days or the hours or the minutes that you actually need that kind of capacity which is a very good thing from a financial perspective. So um, if we look at a, a also from how we got here from a cloud perspective um, I got this, this image that I, I kind of like. Um, uh, I started my career in, a career in the 80s and um, back in the day it was all about Making a call to a, a modem bank or a nice, you know, uh, through through telephone dial-up connections, uh, connecting to the internet at the time using modem technology. I'm sure most of you hopefully have uh, lived through that, uh, but uh, it was extremely slow, of course, and and it was just to browse the internet. Really, wasn't to really do anything more than that at the time, um, and then uh, you know throughout the 80s and 90s, um, we move into uh, data centers, uh, this collocation ISPs or ISP.3, ISP stands for Internet Service Provider. Um, and uh, they put together these collocation facilities for hoteling for computers, if you will, you know, where you can actually take your servers um, over there from your data center, uh, which was most likely not uh, able to sustain uh, we're in here in South Florida a hurricane for example it's very expensive to build a data center that can sustain um, a hurricane uh, so they start moving their equipment uh, what we call in the technology world the lift and shift uh, you lift your your data center and you move it into a colocation facility and you basically pay for the space but the colocation facility not only give you that but also gives you connectivity to multiple carriers uh, that are connected to the internet uh, at a fairly low cost. So that was kind of uh, uh, one of the big promises that, were, that was delivered by, by the colocation facilities in the 90s and if you look at around the country there's hundreds of colocation facilities if not I mean thousands I'm sorry uh, of colocation facilities in the, in, in the US already that are delivering you know that exact service as it was back in the 90s um, but um, but then you know we have been you know moving up in terms of evolving the the, the ISPs if you will uh, to where you can now host applications um, into these data centers uh, and only pay you know for what you need uh, and that started to be you know more of the concepts of what the cloud can do, um, and uh, you have these these uh, software as a service, which we're going to be talking about the different models for cloud, and one is software as a service, where you can basically are you know hosting software and paying only for what you need for those licenses when you use them and and for just the exact amount that you need. Um, and and the, the good thing about it, just compared to how it is today, some companies, most companies, buy licenses based on the number of users they have. Let's say you know if you have a thousand users in your organization, um, you'll buy let's say a thousand uh, licenses of Office, uh, Microsoft Office. Um, but you know if you have 935 employees, uh, you'll be paying for you know. 65 licenses that you don't really need to pay for uh, and that's what one of the beauty uh, about the SaaS models is that you can only pay obviously for what you need and I'm, I'm 
I'm going to sound like a broken record in terms of um, making sure you know that you the keyword is paying for what you need and that's one of the key promises that uh, the cloud delivers today and then you know right now we're more on a dynamic uh, optimized infrastructure uh, that we're uh, that we see right now uh, where you have major players in the in the industry that have these massive data centers spread out around the world which can you can dynamically uh, move you know your 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 technology let's say can run better in data center a versus data center b and it will move your application if you will you know dynamically into those data centers and it will scale uh, your application based on whatever is being you know whatever the end users are asking to access those type of applications so if you have somebody uh, in Europe um, and you uh, you uh, and, and you are developing the application or you have it hosted in the US and let's say which you are with a carrier or with a provider like Amazon you can actually migrate and the application will be delivered faster uh, to the end user um, from a data center that Amazon has in Europe so your application can scale that way. So it's very interesting how that uh, that works. That requires quite a bit of technical work in most cases, um, but it is it is it is being delivered today, and it will continue to evolve. So let's look at the three types of clouds that uh, people, um, you know, everybody is uh, nowadays talking about. The one, the first cloud is your typical private cloud, which is you know your services are being managed. Um, within the organization so you basically go and say I have 50 servers here on my on my office on my on my on my organization I'm going to take those you know 50 servers not physical physically but the 50 the equivalent of those 50 servers I'm going to run it on a cloud provider like HP or you know Rackspace and those folks out there um, so you can you know, pay for the the computing. I mean, the processor that you need. If you need a fast processor, some you know, uh, or, you know, they have different what they call uh, packages. So let's say you have a small kind of need for processing. So you buy a small server, let's say, uh, and that server is made out of uh, the computing aspect, which is the processor that it needs to run this application that you need the memory that you need, uh, the storage, the hard drives or the storage that you need in terms of megabytes that you want to store in this in this provider and the networking piece, you know, what kind of security you need around it So because you build basically your own network within this provider uh, that you are going to. Uh, and then, you know, you are managing that yourself for the most case, for the most part. Uh, and I'm not going to go into it, but uh, you have full access to those, to those, to those uh, servers, if you will, right? Um, the public cloud is a little bit different, where you know you are basically um, using uh, this the services that uh, this provider will give you. You don't you you can still select the the kind of capacity that you need. But you don't really control, you know, the actual instances or servers that they're giving you. Um, so you normally access this through a uh, an internet browser. In most cases, access this your 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 infrastructure. So it's a little it's uh, and it's sharing a lot of the infrastructure with many other different providers uh, or many many different customers that the, these uh, these guys have. Um, and then there's a combination of, of a hybrid cloud, which is a combination of both. Um, so some there's some 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 of that being um, uh, being implemented today. Um, and, the, and the the perfect example is the one I mentioned earlier, where you need let's say uh, all three in peak season, you need 30 servers, uh, but you have uh, let's say 20 that are running on your on your on your infrastructure well if uh, on a hybrid cloud you can basically you know 
move your loads, your capacity to the public cloud or to a private or public cloud either way. I'm sorry, and this is a little confusing, but you know, you can basically go into a hybrid cloud solution and only use what you need at that moment in time. So, um, so you have still your 20 servers on your infrastructure, but the other 30 that you need really are being, the, let's say, um, you're contracting with this cloud provider to allow you to use those 30 servers when you need them. So it kind of it combines the, the two models. Um, and, and that is more of uh, very few providers really are delivering this type of solution today in terms of a hybrid infrastructure because it requires you to do for your applications to be, you know, able to, you know, run in two different data centers uh, almost at the same time. So that requires some, some changes into the kind of applications that you have. And, and, and if it is uh, programming, you may need to reprogram some of your applications to be able to leverage uh, a hybrid cloud model. So, um, if we, so now if there's different models, you know, so we have the public, the private, and the hybrid type of clouds. So now within those, those private or public clouds or hybrid, you can then do different things. Uh, so one of the first things that you do uh, or that are offered out there is what is called infrastructure as a service or IIS. And what that means is basically you're moving your computing, uh, your servers, your networking, your storage, your memory needs. You're moving, you move those into uh, these infrastructures or these providers, as you see here, Amazon Web Services, uh, uh, Rackspace, Terramark, now Verizon, um, CSC. These are one, and uh, Microsoft, Azure. Um, these are the leaders today in the infrastructure as a service uh, in space. Uh, the largest by far, you know, that, uh, and the one that is more uh, advanced than anyone else is Amazon uh, Web Services. Uh, most people think of Amazon as a, as a retailer, uh, an e-commerce retailer for, for books and now for all sorts of different products. But Amazon has been very diligently uh, been working on investing uh, into this technology to be able to accommodate the needs for almost any kind of organization that wants to run their infrastructure in their, on their data centers. So Amazon has almost 26 data centers worldwide. They're spread out, you know, all the way from Asia, all the way obviously through the U.S. Uh, and you can basically, uh, you know, if you if you have an issue in in the U.S. for some reason from an availability perspective, you can run your servers from any of the data centers anywhere in the world. Uh, so you're talking every other, in the entire, con every single continent they have a data center today, uh, or more than one actually. So they have built a massive infrastructure and so is, you know, uh, Microsoft is kind of behind this as well. Um, but, uh, but what they do is basically host your servers and your typical infrastructure that you have in your data center. Then you have other, um, another model that can run either on a public or in a private cloud. And that's one of the things that I'm, not, I'm going to keep the hybrid cloud aside for now. Uh, and then you have this application, this, uh, this platform as a servers or PAS, um, where you can then have your development being done on those servers. So maybe from a technical perspective, I'll, I'll try to decipher this a little bit. When you are developing applications, you normally have a set of languages. You know, you're using a language. Uh, that language, you know, comes from a software perspective. You have to buy those, the software that can allow you to program on those languages. And those are normally run in your, in your own data center. Uh, at the same time that you have those, those that, that software, you have libraries that you use. If you think about going to a library and finding an, uh, lots of books, and you pick whatever book you like because that's what you need to basically do your project. They, in the development world, it's the same thing. You have your 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 language, 
uh, that you're programming on and you pick different libraries um, that have a specific functions or things that you need to make your application work the way you want it. So instead of having all that in your own infrastructure, in your own organization, now you have um, uh, these platform as a service companies that gives you all the library, uh, it gives you the infrastructure as well that is behind it, um, and it, uh, it allows you to build applications on the web uh, that are highly scalable, right, uh, that you can go to market very quickly, um, and um, and then, to, you know, at a fairly low cost in, in some ways. So these are some of the key ones. Google uh, Upworks is, is, is a is a major player where you see a lot of different uh, products being developed on that platform uh, and you probably are using some of those products today uh, without you knowing it. And then you have another uh, which is pretty much the most typical one uh, that you see out there uh, is software as a service which is you know your typical uh, I need to get some software to run on my company so one of the I guess the easier one to talk about would be Microsoft Office 365 with their email. Um, they have an email. They have um, their office applications, meaning Word, PowerPoint, and Excel, uh, that you can run on the cloud, right? So you need a browser to be able to access those, those applications. And then you have your email uh, that is also delivered as a service. So um, and just to give you a, a point, a case, uh, a point in terms of cost, the email about five years ago used to be about when they came out with this service, uh, used to be about seventeen dollars per mail per user, right, per month, and with certain amount of storage. I believe it was five gigabytes of storage to store your email uh, in in on the cloud, right? Today. Um, the Office 365 for email is about four dollars per mailbox, um, and it gives you more features than obviously five years ago. And you get about 50 gigabytes, I believe, of storage. Right? So you got now a lot of more storage, a lot more functionality, uh, and a much lesser cost than five years ago, or less actually, was, I would say four years ago. So what does that mean? If you have your own data center and you're hosting email, right, it doesn't make any sense uh, anymore. Financially, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, technically, it doesn't make sense because you're going to be upgrading. You need to upgrade in your email system. You have uh, probably some, some issues with replicating that email to another data center. That's very costly. Uh, you probably don't have that technology. Uh, so you know, you get a lot more with Office 365 because they're giving you uh, full, re full, full access, I mean, redundancy to your email system within all of the data centers that Microsoft has worldwide. So it's fully replicated and they are responsible to make sure that, uh, you know, they deliver that on a, almost on a 100% basis, you know, 100% of the time, just like your electricity. But the key thing there is that it's a very low cost. Um, Salesforce is another major uh, software as a service. Uh, it's a huge company out of California that delivers CRM solutions, so customer relationship management solutions, at a fairly low cost as well. Uh, you know, CRM systems traditionally have been extremely expensive to implement. I mean, you're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, where nowadays you can implement the same kind of functionality for a fraction of that cost. And that's the key things that these technologies really offer is a fairly low cost of entry uh, with tremendous amount of functionality and, you know, you can access it from anywhere at any time. And then there's a couple of other ones that are more um, uh, out there that you probably are using some of these ones again, uh, like this business process as a service uh, or BPAS kind of uh, platforms. Uh, like ADP uh, with your payroll processing, uh, they do that on the web, uh, all on the cloud. Uh, you use LinkedIn, I'm sure, to connect with your professional uh, contacts, and that is obviously a business process. They call it an information business process as a service type of things. Uh, Google Analytics, that is giving you lots of information about 
traffic on your website and all that. That is all done through uh, web uh, and they're not really per se applications, they're more information services um, type of solutions that are out there in the internet today. And there's a new kind of a uh, comer into this space uh, that is more these cloud brokerage services. Uh, and CSBs uh, are really services that, that are basically bringing uh, like a, if you will, a marketplace uh, that you can go and access, you know, pretty much anything you need to run a business, you know, whether you need uh, any of these kind of uh, players out here that you see, and there's a lot more than these people that I have here on the screen, but, I mean companies, uh, sorry, uh, but uh, these are marketplaces where you say, you know, I'm going to start up my own business and I need an accounting system, I need a CRM system, I need uh, obviously my office applications, um, and I need, you know, to have this kind of capacity to scale on, if you will, and, and all that. So these, these, these services are brokering um, that access so you can have a single kind of place where you can, you know, access hundreds if not thousands of applications. Uh, all you know on the by clicking on your screen and and entering your credit card, uh, if you will. You know, so these are these are a new a newcomer into this space, and what that means is that you're gonna you know now have access be much easier to buy uh, you know cloud services using these broker models. So. Um, so anyway, so a couple of, you know, one more thing in, in terms of how you adopt these clouds and this is kind of a little bit confusing, but hopefully it's not too confusing, but if you have the, the models that we discussed, the infrastructure as a service, the platform as a service, and the software as a service going into the business process as a service, you really start from, you know, starting from the left hand side here on the bottom, you go with what we call rehost, and rehost is basically taking what you have on your data center and moving it to a cloud-based provider. That is rehosting your, 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 your data center, and that is mostly done at the infrastructure as a service platform. And then you go through a refactor. The refactor means that, you know, you're basically getting rid of, you know, you're, 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 you're changing the kind of capacity that you need. Um, you're changing the actual you know, footprint, or if you say I was using, when I rehost, I was using 30 loads of computers, let's say 30 servers to make it easy. Uh, now I can change this with this cloud provider that gives me uh, this type of capacity, and now I may not need this 30, I may need 20, uh, and different kind of capacity needs because they give me X, Y, or Z kind of things. So this is a refactoring kind of thing, and then you go through a revise to a replace type of process where you may be able to replace your own existing applications, you know, and one of the key things I've seen, for example, is companies that uh, are using, let's say, an Oracle kind of application to run their business, and then when they go into the cloud or they see the offerings in the cloud, they really replace that application with something that is, you know, uh, an application that has been deliver, de uh, developed just for the cloud that can replace perhaps the Oracle functionality at a much lesser cost. Uh, so that is that is one of the things that uh, you go through, and and this is not for your entire data center. This could be just the roadmap for a specific application that you have or a specific uh, service that you have in your infrastructure. Um, and then in terms of, you know, the time that it takes, you know, um, what I normally, what I've seen is that, you know, you first start with the change, the systems that you can really innovate uh, or maybe bring some new technologies into your organization. Uh, a lot of organizations in the technology space really suffer from lack of innovation. And one way to really innovate in most companies is to use these cloud-based technologies. So, um, so if you look at it into the outer circle here, you start with you know changing um, or bringing new applications into the space of let's say I mentioned about email. Uh, well, you had your traditional email system where it was hosted, 
by, by, by the IT folks in the organizations, now you're running this on the cloud. You're developing and test environments. Um, your web servers that you can actually run easily on the cloud. Um, collaboration is huge uh, uh, as an application to run on the cloud. Um, some specific CRM solutions, like I mentioned, the, 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 the Salesforce example. So these are, you know, and some productivity applications like Microsoft Office and so on. So these are applications that you first normally start with and you migrate to a cloud. Um, obviously, you got to do your due diligence in terms of what, obviously, the cost it would be to make those migrations. And uh, that's one of the things that we do here at Oxys is really uh, do these kind of assessments. Um, but you start with the syst those kind of systems, uh, and then you start coming into the more of the, the gray circle here where you start really replacing some of the kind of applications that are running, for example, HR. Uh, like we talk about ADP, offering HR solutions for that. Uh, your account, you know, your account systems, your accounting systems that can run on the cloud today. Most of them can do run on the cloud. Uh, product design, help desk, those type of applications. And then you go, the last thing you really would replace is your core systems or your systems of record. Uh, so meaning your ERP systems, uh, your supply chain systems. Uh, those type of systems, those are the things that you would really would replace more down the road. And this is the picture pretty much today in terms of adoption. Uh, but uh, that is that is you know because I would think that within the next five to you know six years or so, maybe seven, uh, we're going to see new offerings coming in in the cloud that are going to basically target uh, companies to replace the core systems by cloud-based solutions, which, you know, most of the traditional software companies that deliver these core systems um, are coming up and they're quickly, you know, trying to come up with solutions that they can run that core system on the cloud. And that could be one way that most companies may be able to move their core systems from their infrastructure to a cloud or, you know, um, there's also newcomers that are delivering or developing new solutions that can target these core systems because from a, from a financial perspective, these are the systems that most of the time are the most costly for most organizations to operate, right? Um, so, you know, a couple of things about the advantages and concerns, um, you know, that we discuss. Uh, the advantages, you know, the instant and easy access to resources, right? There's really no long-term commitments uh, with the cloud, um, which, you know, you can, you can go on a weekly basis, almost on a daily basis, or even in some cases on an hourly basis, uh, and just pay for that. Uh, you can pay with uh, your credit card, which is uh, a pretty new thing for IT. And then, um, you know, uh, you basically scale as you need, uh, and that is one of the greatest things and benefits for the cloud from a technology perspective. And you're basically worrying about, you know, running your business and not really the technology. I mean, there is a lot to say about having your own IT people that are running servers and networks and security and all so on. Uh, instead of having, you know, that out of your, you know, out of out of out of sight, in some ways being ba basically delivered by a cloud provider, which in most cases have much stronger security and governance than any company can do on their own, because they have to do something, they have to build for obviously running thousands and thousands of customers on it, so they have to be pretty strict on their governance, um, and you can try it, right? Um, you can try um, and justify it later. In other words, you know, you can easily go and just buy uh, one or two licenses, run the whole thing on the cloud, see how it works. Uh, you don't have to really, you know, uh, make a significant investment in servers and networks and IT people setting everything up. So it's pretty easy to try that on your own. Um, so the uh, key concerns, and there's kind of less and less nowadays. Um, one is the data privacy, uh, obviously, uh, because there is no real standards today for uh, data privacy on the for cloud-based providers. There are some initiatives right now, and 
keep in mind that this technology is not so new, but it is not very old either. So the standards are not really there 100 percent, but like I said, there is some uh, bodies out there that are putting together uh, specific uh, standards for data privacy that has to be followed by each of the cloud providers. But these are things that you got to do within the due diligence when you start really adopting these type of technologies. Um, and security has been a big one. Uh, not so much anymore as it used to be, but it still is, is a concern. Um, it's a top of mind concern, no matter whether it's cloud or not, it's still the top of mind for most CIOs in terms of, you know, uh, what, uh, how this is being done. Uh, so when you actually have that obviously running outside of your organization, you got to be pretty sure about what it is. But what I can say about security, and I mentioned a few things about this, is that these cloud providers really are spending a significant amount of dollars putting together very strong security frameworks uh, that they can protect themselves because you know they're preparing and 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 their goal is to accommodate you know thousands if not millions of users in their infrastructures so they have to have you know a serious security frameworks uh, in place and governance that like I said earlier most companies just can afford or can even think that they would have such a such a stringing kind of requirements to for security than these clouds have. So what I found is that when you look behind the scenes into these kind of cloud providers, and I'm talking the bigger players, they have very very strong security. Um, and jurisdiction is a big issue, uh, and it's still an issue that is more of an attorney kind of discussion. But you know, uh, your data could be sitting in a data center in Hong Kong. You know, and uh, so if you need it, um, how do you do that, right? So that's that's a major thing. If there's an issue with the provider, you know, how do you actually get back to your get your data, or uh, who's really has jurisdiction over your assets, right? So that's a major, that's a big concern that has to be also uh, looked into. Um, same thing I mentioned about data location. Uh, like I said, the cloud providers can move your data you know, to whatever data center they want to, you know, and sometimes you don't even know. Uh, but as long as they're delivering the service and the service level that they have with you in terms of performance and availability, you know, you don't really care where it is. Uh, so, but they need to make those changes so they can lower their costs in some cases. So it's very important to know kind of where your data is. Um, and data migration and loss control, you know, is, these are also concerns out there in terms of, you know, moving your information to these cloud providers could be pretty expensive, you know, and sometimes just that alone can kill the, the return investment that you may make in on moving to a cloud, but those are obviously uh, things that you must also look into and the loss of control is kind of tied to the security, but those are some of the key, key concerns that should be addre uh, addressed when you actually are considering these type of cloud services. But once again, a lot of these concerns are being addressed on a daily basis by most of these by the, by the cloud providers because you know it is it is it, it is still kind of a uh, in some a little bit a, a, an open standard out there for these type of things. So now, using the cloud, many companies, every, pretty much everybody is using the cloud today, uh, from startups to very large enterprises. Um, I'm actually involved in a project right now of migrating some massive amount of computing needs uh, processing from a typical colocation facility to, uh, to the Amazon, for example, cloud. Um, so once you move that to the, to the Amazon, is then how we can you know, uh, potentially leverage other cloud providers to, you know, as a contingency to using the Amazon cloud. But the interesting thing is that, you know, where everybody's already discussing how we can actually use uh, the cloud to, you know, you know, do these type of things. So most companies, if there's, you know, when they're, it's like I mentioned earlier in the first slides, is top of mind in most cases to how they move things to the cloud and lower their costs. But the real benefit that I've seen a lot uh, from a cost entry perspective is for startups and small businesses uh, to using the cloud. I mean, you can run your accounting system and actually I think I have a, an example here in a few in terms of uh, um, 
what, uh, how you can actually, how much it would cost you this compared to a regular um, uh, traditional kind of buying your software and so forth. Uh, but a couple of things here in terms of spend, you'll see that a lot of the spend here um, is going to be really uh, done on, on, on it's going to continue to increase, you know, from today to 12 months, and this is from Gardner numbers from a couple of years ago. But the point here is that they are tracking the spend, and if you see the today numbers, right, uh, this is based on the number of users in the organizations, are just basically going to double in most cases in terms of spend. So the, the trends are there, uh, and, and it's, it is happening. So once again, the cloud is here to stay. So I, ha I mentioned about a small case scenario, and this will be a, one more slide or so. Uh, in terms of you know a small company with 30 users and some mobile workforce uh, selling products on the internet. Well, from a cloud perspective, they can use QuickBooks Online, which is really like, I think it's like 10 or $15 a user per month instead of buying the full license and having to host it on yourself on your hardware. Yeah, email, they're using Exchange, you know, Microsoft, uh, Office apps, the customer relationship. Uh, hopefully, they will, they will use this to support them when they need it. But, um, but then, you know, and the laptops, they just use Think Clients. Uh, Think Clients are these little devices that don't run any software. Everything is running on the cloud. And then their cost is, as you see, per user, uh, is, it's about, you know, $20 per month for all the office productivity applications. Um, the accounting is about 40 uh, Actually, I was, this is an example using um, uh, a middle market uh, product from Microsoft called Dynamics. And then Salesforce, you know, it's about $15 a month. So this is, this is just kind of giving an example of what those potential costs would be for the, for the organization. I mean, this would not be the case if you would have to go, obviously, and buy hardware, all licenses, software, the implementation, and all that stuff that goes with it. So it's, this is more of a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, pretty much on a regular kind of steady state kind of operation. There's some cost to transition and to migrate um, to these cloud providers, but uh, it's normally about 20 to 30 percent of your monthly cost that you'll be paying for that. So it's, it's, a, it's a very quick way to get in and the best thing about it is that you can actually get to use all these applications literally within a week or so you'll be able to have access to these applications and be operating those applications on your own. So very, very uh, powerful kind of uh, offering. So what's next? You know, I, I see that it's uh, a vast adoption for services. Uh, like I mentioned, most companies really are working on how they're going to migrate their, 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 their loads or their capacity to the cloud. They're using applications on the cloud. I'm, I'm just not talking about only moving your servers and all that stuff to the cloud. I'm also looking at migrating or adopting cloud-based technologies to run their applications. And there will be virtual desktops that uh, already are to there. The, uh, at that cost, where nine dollars, you know, per month or ten dollars a month, uh, we're running Office. So you basically, uh, Google is coming up with some desktop technology that is very interesting. So you only need is your 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 that your your browser um, and a Think Client, which these Think Clients are less than three hundred dollars, to be able to have a fully access, fully you know, virtual desktop. Um, there will be no more servers in house. Obviously, they will be moved to the cloud. And these hybrid utility-based solutions uh, that I mentioned earlier about the hybrid cloud will be pretty much coming more into play. Uh, but like I said, the cloud is here to stay, and it's definitely going to get uh, better. So if you're interested uh, on the cloud, we can do a complementary assessment on your technology and how we can help you migrate uh, to a cloud, whether it costs, you know, from a cost-benefit perspective, does it make any sense? Um, and some of the pros and cons of actually making those type of uh, migrations for your own organization. So if you're interested, uh, you know, you can contact us, contact here, uh, contact us here at Oxys or at, uh, you can contact, uh, contact Pedro here at the email that is on the screen. So with that said, um, I am uh, done pretty much right on time. I wanted to um, see if there's any questions, which I think there's some questions here. So, uh, Jasmine, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Alvaro. One of our uh, participants are asking, um, how frequent are 
frequent are cloud outages from cloud service providers like Rackspace, Amazon, Verizon, Terramark? Uh, well, I would say that uh, they, there have been um, some reports of some outages uh, on Microsoft, for example, with their Office 365 that, were, that was down for uh, almost a day, which was significant for them. Uh, they did have some remedies, financial remedies for that, and most of the cloud providers really have financial remedies for downtime, um, but it's less frequent. Uh, it used to be, you know, was kind of an issue some time ago, a couple of years ago, but it's less frequent now because these providers really are building tremendous amount of data centers around the world where they can replicate and be up and running uh, into their data centers. What, what you see most of the time, the issue with availability is their own clients not being able to access the internet. Uh, and that is obviously outside of the cloud provider um, uh, scope. But uh, most companies really have issues, you know, when their inter internet uh, service go down, which, you know, if you're going to the cloud and you're using pretty much everything on the cloud, you definitely need to have a strategy in terms of how your connectivity is going to be to, to the cloud. That's going to be a very important thing to consider. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Alvaro. Um, there's another question. What are some important SLAs that I should look for when selecting an infrastructure as a service cloud provider? An SLA is a service level agreement, which is pretty much the commitment from the provider to deliver their services to you. And you should not, you know, be any less, and I say this uh, uh, with the same way that uh, you would expect to receive electricity in your own home. So, you know, you probably don't know what your SLA with FPNL if you're in Florida is or your, your utility-based company, uh, but in most cases it's close to 100%. So you should expect, you know, uh, to get or try to, 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 to get them uh, to agree to an SLA that is in the 99% for sure, especially for core applications. 99.349s would be ideal uh, because one of those, you know, every night that you take out of the 99 equation is about four hours of downtime and you may not be able to afford that. So definitely need to make sure that you're in the 99% range. For sure, you know, 99 plus four nines, I would say. Okay. So, any other questions, Jasmine? No, no other questions from our participants. So, I want to thank you, Alvaro, and to all of our participants for joining us today. Um, please watch for our follow-up email with the replay link along with a copy of this presentation. And also, if you could please take a moment to complete our brief exit survey. And on behalf of Alvaro and the Oxus team, we thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. Goodbye.